And there's a fine line between being outside of your comfort zone and doing something that goes against your gut instinct. Today on the show, I'm happy to have Seth Early. He's the CEO of Early Information Science. They're a professional services company that helps organizations build out their global information architecture. And the importance of finding the right team, and then especially when choosing that, kind of moving between comfort and proper fit. What has been your experience with that, Seth? I've been through a couple of leadership hires and, and many times it takes months to let a senior person get the lay of the land and figure things out. I never quite understood that, but when we come into an organization as a consultancy, we have to hit the ground running and produce value right away. But I was going by the expertise and the guidance of my advisors, my advisory board, other people that were kind of mentors and coaches. And so I was abiding by their process. And part of it was when you have a senior person, you have to give them time to really get settled and, and understand how to run the organization. So we went through a process of hiring a chief operating officer, and it was about a six month long process, it cost a lot of money, hundreds of candidates. And we got to the end and I ended up hiring this person. And actually I hired the number two candidate as well for a different position. And what was interesting is the first thing she did was she brought in her right-hand person from her other company. And that's a warning sign, right? And, and threatened to quit if we didn't hire this person. But I was uncomfortable, but I dealt with it. I said, okay, this is somebody who has this experience that I need. They've done this before. Let me just deal with my discomfort. And there's a fine line between being outside of your comfort zone and doing something that goes against your gut instinct. And I didn't, and that's a fuzzy line, right? When are you crossing that? When are you, when should you just go with your gut versus deal with the discomfort of being outside your comfort zone? Because whenever you're trying to do something differently or be a different company or be a different person, you're outside your comfort zone. That's the nature of growth. And so in this case, I knew in my heart of hearts that this was not a good uh, person, a good leader for this company. And they did good work, but they just too, took too long. They didn't understand the clock speed of a small organization. And my advisors, again, were saying, this is the best team you've ever had. It's a record year for the company, but it really wasn't from work that they had done. It was momentum that came into that year. But in, in retrospect, it was a very poor hire. It had a, a lot of tail end effects that, or volatile effects that lasted a couple of years, lost a lot of money, lost some key employees. So in the end, it was, my instincts were right. I should have trusted myself and I didn't trust myself because again, I had, I was just outside of my comfort zone and then I was not trusting my instincts and I should have just trusted my instincts. And that has a lot of history as well. We're all kind of frauds before we are what we want to be, right? When we want to be something else, there's always that imposter syndrome because you're not there yet. Right. So you have to pretend you're something else or have something aspirational about your company or about yourself. And then you grow into that thing you want to become. So there's always this sense of, am I doing this right? <laughs> Are people going to find me out? And so many times you look to outside expertise or you look to guidance or mentor or advisor or somebody who's been there before. And again, those people aren't always right. <laughs> so anyway, so that was one experience with that had really consequential impact. It was only running the, the company off the uh, clip. It was a record year. We we're doing great. And, uh, and it came crashing to all by the end of that year, big losses and so on. So anyway, that's my story about trusting your gut versus being outside your comfort zone. So now do you trust your gut in most situations? I do. And I think the other thing is it's, I was too logical and rational, right? I would listen to stories. And when you listen to stories, there's always a story, right? There's always a plan for remediation. There's always something that's happening, right? Oh yeah, we're aware of the problems. We're working on it. We fix it. We hear you. We understand. And then there's a story for what they're going to do. But you can't just listen to the words. You really have to look at these, look at the person and say, is this person truly being authentic? Is this something that I'm, if I feel, do I feel this? And there was always a feeling that was off. Right. It, the words made sense. The rationale was there, but the feeling wasn't there. Right. It was like, could I really trust these people? And I'm a very logical, rational person. I want to listen to my rational mind, 
but I should have been listening to my, 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 <laughs> my feelings, right? I should have been listening to my gut. That's what people call your gut instinct, right? It's that right brain thinking versus that left brain logical. It's the emotions, right? And had, and if I look at it in retrospect, there are clearly times when, when I was hearing stories and if I just, even thinking back, looking at the emotions behind that. It was nonsense, right? They were just milking it and it was very unfortunate. But I wanted to trust in the best of people. I wanted to trust in the outcome. I wanted to trust the process, right? I wanted to trust my advisors. I wanted to trust these people who were part of my leadership team. And in retrospect, somebody, the accounting head said that the person who was brought in for finance that this woman brought in was quote unquote playing with the numbers at the end of the month. They pay down a million and a half line, dollar line of credit the end of the month wouldn't show me the complete balance sheet and then they'd run it up right after that. So it always looked like we had plenty of buffers out and it just wasn't the case. So there was no, numerous things like that, that I found out, some of which I found out afterwards, some red flags during the process. But again, I chose to not pay as much attention to those red flags and I instead depended too much on my rational thinking and my logical mind. How did the business end up recovering from that? Um, it was, it was a while we had, there was also an off balance sheet debt to, to a vendor of a million dollars that they told the vendor not to bring up with me. And so it was really, it's almost like, there's only so much you can check, you can test and check. There's, you have to have some trust. You have to have trust in your leadership team. This was not a leadership team that I, team that I should have trusted, but we ended up with a surprise loss, uh, uh half a million dollars, uh, for the last quarter of the year. Another loss of a million dollars the next quarter because the pipeline was empty, but it, it took time. We had to pay down the bank. We had to pay down the vendors. We paid everything off. There was also a lawsuit from their tenure because of poor contract hygiene, not getting change orders signed. So we ended up giving away about $500,000 in free work to a vent to a customer because they did not get change orders signed. So there's so many ramifications, including poor hires and then losing good people. But it took a couple of years uh, to recover and we're doing great. It's, it's a very good market for us. And especially with generative AI, the work we do in knowledge management, knowledge architecture, product information management, all very necessary because people don't realize that generative AI is not a magic bullet, right? It still requires a foundation of good data, good content, good knowledge. And there are lots of ways to protect the company from the uh, downsides of generative AI, if you use certain approaches. So it's a great market for us. There's a lot of, it's, it's very noisy, right? And everybody has a generative AI uh, offering, but uh, people who know us know that we've been doing this work for 25 years, that work that's been necessary. I wrote a book three years ago called the AI powered enterprise. And when I first saw generative uh, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, I thought, oh my God, it's my work no longer relevant. And then the more I researched, the more I looked into it, the more relevant it is ever. That, everything in that book is still even more appropriate today than it was in 2020. And somebody just posted an article of mine from 2016 called There's No AI Without IA. And they posted on LinkedIn saying this article was more relevant today than it was in 2016. So it really feels the time has, has come for this organization and the work we do. And the market is ready. It's noisy. It's crowded. But uh, we're seeing some great progress. So how do you withstand with such a long run, the times when the market isn't saying this is what we need? Yeah, it's hard because it, you have to have a vision and you have to have execution. You know, I like to say the vision without execution is delusion, right? So there's a fine line between being a visionary and being self-deluded, right? If you can't execute and you can't bring it to market, everybody has always appreciated like the market, the, the experts, the thought leaders. I've always appreciated the work that we've done, but it's hard for the average business stakeholder or technologist sometimes in an organization to appreciate where the market is going, appreciate what they need to do for the future. Everybody's very focused on immediate needs. So one of the things that we try to do is while we have that vision of the future, we set organizations up for success in the short term. Look at the very practical problems they have today like findability, like product, product navigation or search or access to support content. All of those things are very practical problems, access to, to business intelligence, 
uh, analysis. Those are all very practical problems today that can be solved in such a way that it also paves the way for the future and, and enables the organization to have new capabilities, to build new capabilities and future proof what they're doing. So we always try to provide that vision of what's possible, right? Personalization at scale by orchestrating product information, content, knowledge throughout that customer journey. That's really something that most organizations have not done in a very comprehensive way. Lots of organizations have done pieces of it, but when we present that vision, it's resonant, right? It resonates, but people say, oh, it's too far away or it's too hard or we're not going to get there. And, he, and we say, well, you can solve these intermediary problems, right? You can solve these short-term goals. So whenever we do a long-term roadmap, there's always short-term wins on that roadmap that say, let's make sure we show value today because you can't have year-long projects with a surprise at the end, right? Executives will, will no longer have patience. You won't get the support. You won't get the funding. So you have to show that value as you go. But yes, it is hard because it, the timing to the marketplace is very important. We built one of the first virtual assistants on the marketplace called Allstate Business Insurance Expert. And that was like 2017, 2016. And the president of Allstate Business Insurance said, and this made into a Harvard Business Review article and won some awards, but they said, this is, this is far exceeding my expectations or what I thought was possible. And they still use the same component architecture that we built for them. We have another company that handles a million knowledge transactions per day. They started in several years ago, and they actually use it to power all of their virtual assistants. So the stuff we've done has been, has endured over decades, but I knew, and I, when I say decades, I actually do have a uh, client that's still using a governance plan. We built them 15 years ago. And uh, five years, when I, I ran into them five years after we did it, it was supposed to be an 18 month project or roadmap. They said, I said, oh, I have those deliverables if you'd like to look at them. They go, oh no, we have those. Really? He goes, we call it the Bible. And then I ran into them another five years later and they said, back five years ago, you used to call it the Bible. They said, we still call it the Bible. And then a few years after that, they were still using it because it was something that could evolve and grow with the organization. And it's especially for artificial intelligence these days to have that right governance and decision-making process and all of the metrics behind it. But the principles are valid. They've been proven. And so I'm confident in that. But I know, I knew after we did the Allstate project that it would, it would be hard to sell because there were so many new vendors coming out into the space saying it was a million dollar project that took about a year, but it reduced their cost area volume by something 30%, something ridiculous. It's not even believable what you talk to call center people, but there was some other factors. People coming in saying, yeah, I can do that for $20,000. And, and when you're competing with a $20,000 AI startup with their machine learning magic pixie dust, you say to the client, try it. And of course they try it. It doesn't work, but they go down that path. So it became difficult to sell people on the correct way of doing it versus the simple static bot that came after that. So sometimes being first to the market is not the best, right? Because you, you are blazing a trail, you're blazing a trail for your competitors, and then a larger company with more resources can come along, and pick up those pieces. But that said, we still have done lots of those projects and we still use the same core approaches and methodologies. And we've been building those methodologies uh, for over two decades. So it's, uh, it is hard when the market isn't quite there or you're too early in the market and it's hard to hit it uh, exactly. So Seth, if our listeners wanted to get in touch, learn more about your services, how could they do? Sure. They could go to www.early and that's E-A-R-L-E-Y. Don't forget the E before the Y, early.com. They can also find me on LinkedIn. I'm Seth Early, S-E-T-H-E-A-R-L-E-Y. I'm also on Twitter. So feel free to reach out and where you can send me an email, seth at early.com. Three, as long as you remember how to spell the last name, it's pretty easy to get. So first name at lastname.com. So happy to talk shop with anyone or tell more stories. Well, thank you, Seth, for coming on the show and everybody for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. Make sure to smash that subscribe button. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time.